Welcome. We're joined by political consultant Eric Hakopian. We'll be discussing how Armenian foreign policy should approach the different power centers around the world. Eric, thank you very much for your time. It's a pleasure. So let's start off with Russia. Mm -hmm. I think many Armenians have been reevaluating their perception of Russia since the signing of the ceasefire agreement. We know that there's many Russian peacekeepers now in Karabakh. How do you think the new foreign minister and the government should approach Russia? Well, I, I don't, we should uh, do away with any illusions. Uh, Russia is the hegemon we're married to now. Uh, and you have to look at it in practical ways. What are the positives of that? And you know, what are the negatives of that? But most importantly is how you play your hand. You know, uh, politics or international politics even is, it's a, it's a constant set of cards that you get. Uh, sometimes you get, uh, you know, cards in a bad situation. Sometimes you get it in a good situation. It's, it's all really about making the best of the cards that you have at hand, not the cards that you wish to have. Uh, I think obviously this is a relationship of unequals. Uh, clearly. Uh, what are the advantages for, uh, for Armenia? It's frankly, it's security. In this particular case, security for people in Artsakh. And in a very, uh, you know, the world is a troubled place now. It is not necessarily bad to be aligned with a nuclear power. Uh, that obviously can set lines that other people don't cross that we can't set. Uh, so I think we need to look at how we take advantage of the situation in the same way that they're obviously going to try to take advantage of us. This is just not, you know, we need to be, uh, we need to make the best of the situation. Uh, as far as what they get out of it, and I think this is what people had missed, and you know, the sociologist Georgi Derlugian had written this uh, very interesting column about uh, the advantages that Armenia actually provides to the Russia of today. Uh, one is, uh, Unlike their, the other systems that they have tried, you know, backing these strong men like Lukashenko, which always ends in disaster, or these other Central Asian totalitarian states that they have, uh, Armenia is a country that is not under sanction by the West, uh, actually has decent relationships with the West, and has a reformist government that, uh, despite uh, a horrendous loss in the war, it seems like is going to stay in power. Uh, mostly because of the ineptness of the opposition, but that's another matter. Uh, so this, you know, Armenia somewhat plays the role that, could play the role that Hong Kong played for communist China during the day, where it was their access to a world that they, that you're uh, sanctioned out of uh, in, in Russia's case. So I think we need to look at these things in very practical matters. Uh, it's not the ideal situation because obviously the hegemon will do what's good for the hegemon. But it's also a question of how useful do you make yourself to the hegemon. Uh, for example, uh, the Armenian defeat in war was by extension a defeat of the Russian military system. Uh, so as we rebuild our military system in areas that, uh, in all the areas that we need to rebuild our military system are all the same areas that the Russians are very weak at. Uh, whether it's, you know, the drone technology, anti-drone technology, or whether it's the future of warfare, which is actually in robotics. Uh, I think as we build our systems, we can actually help and cooperate with them in rebuilding their systems. So I think there's, uh, we just have to make the, the best of the situation, what's most advantageous, but we should not uh, underestimate what that level of security means in a, in a world that is in, in great flux. Uh, having security relationships with one of the world's primary powers, if not the, obviously not the primary power, uh, can actually be quite beneficial for us in the long run. I'm not, I'm not in any way trying to whitewash the problems that you could have, uh, because that hegemon can easily act against your interests. Uh, but we are very clearly on the same side on one thing. Uh, the, the, the Russians, and when you say the Russians, you're really saying Putin. Uh, have a direct vested interest in trying to limit Turkish influence in this area. And if you look at the way the Russians have acted, uh, you know, you, you compared to Erdogan, Erdogan's all tactics, while Putin is all strategy. Erdogan did all the work, Putin took advantage of it. And they have a vested interest to try to minimize Turkish influence here. And I think on that one, I think we're all on the same page. And what about America? 
Well, obviously, those two places are still the primary sources of power in the world. Uh, I think given the sort of the restoration of the American establishment with the Joe Biden victory, I think you're going to have an America that's far more engaged in the short run. Uh, obviously, this part of the world is not their primary area of interest. Uh, but I think we're going to have an America that's more engaged, and I think that's going to be useful. But partly that really depends on how actively or how well the Armenian American community pressures, acts to force the United States to look for favorable outcomes to the United States, from the United States. Uh, but obviously I think that's a more of a short-term thing. I think in the long run, uh, America's involvement in this part of the world is going to get less and less because I think uh, America is sort of consumed with its own internal crises and I think this Biden thing is really an anomaly and those divisions that are tearing the country apart will, uh, I mean, uh, will accentuate themselves and sort of push the United States out of areas like this that are not in its primary levels of interest. But I think in the short run, I think they can be very helpful. Uh, when you move on to Europe, uh, and I think this is the key one for us, because I think they have far more interest or involvement here, we need to figure out where we fit in the European equation. Uh, if you look at Europe, there's actually four Europes. There's Germany and France, which are the primary powers. Actually, Germany, the junior partner of France. Then there's a secondary Europe, which is Spain, Italy, and the former, the original EU countries, Belgium and places like that. Then there's the, uh, the third level of Europe, which is the Eastern European countries, which are there to be a market, uh, uh, a market and provide cheap labor for the industrial powers of Germany and France. And then there's the fourth rate Europe, which is us. Uh, the Georgias and the Moldovas and places like that. And, and, and then the, the tasks assigned to the fourth Europe is you know, to export raspberries to Germany and to you know, change diapers in Europe. So you have to ask yourself, do you want to be a fourth-rate European or a first-rate Armenian? That might be the question that we really need to resolve. So I think that's where the Europe and the U.S. part ends. So what about the Arab world? Uh, President Armin Sarkisian has traveled to Jordan and the United Arab Emirates. Are there any opportunities in the Arab world for Armenia? Absolutely. Uh, there are untapped opportunities there. And we have to be very clear about what the Arab world is because the Arab world is, you know, stretches from here to Morocco. That's not our level of interest. The Arab world that is relevant to us, you know, is, is the Gulf countries, Iraq, Syria, Lebanon. It's that sort of, you know, the, the Arab world closest to us. Uh, and specifically, the primary powers in the Gulf, which are uh, Dubai, uh, the, the UAE, Saudi Arabia, and Qatar, even though Qatar is, because of the Turkey relationship, is somewhat close to us. So I think uh, when you're dealing with that Arab world, there's two things. There's business and politics. I think in business, it's, it's been silly for us not to look south uh, because these are people that we have a lot of cultural affinities with and understand far better. It's far easier for us to negotiate that world than it is to negotiate the Western world in many ways. So uh, even though there's already significant amounts of trade going on, actually investments from places like the UAE and Armenia, but that is minuscule compared to what it should be. So I think it needs to be a central part of our... Uh, uh, foreign policy approach about to engage the world in trade. Uh, but there's also the issue of uh, politics. And as I have stated before, you know, the two primary powers in the Gulf are uh, the UAE and Saudi Arabia are, are very much anti-Turkish uh, in, in their current orientation right now. And we have not taken advantage of that. I mean, I mean, there's a level of triangulation here because obviously those countries are also adversaries of Iran, which is a country that we'll get to. However, uh, if you're smart enough and you're careful enough, you should be able to triangulate your way of getting those people on your side without uh, angering other people, if done correctly. So I think with that Arab world, it's politics and business. And uh, we have completely underperformed there and underinvested our attention there and focused on our areas that have not been fruitful for us. And you mentioned, what about Iran? I know this is one of the most complex foreign policy areas. Well, I think people think that to the south of us is a country named Iran. Actually, that's not the case. To the south of us is the Shia Crescent. We need to, be, we need to understand that distinction. The Shia Crescent starts in Herat in, uh, in the western part of Afghanistan and ends in the border of Lebanon and Israel. Uh, 
And the Shia Crescent offers us a lot of opportunities for many different reasons. Uh, the Shia world, in, in some ways, and this is not a good analogy, but the Shias are the, uh, the Armenians of Islam. They're the ones that are downtrodden, always oppressed, murdered, killed for their views by the far more uh, tyrannical and uh, usually Turkish Sunni forces, which have always been their primary adversaries for hundreds of years. So we need to understand we have a lot, of com we have a lot in common with that world. You know, when uh, after the Armenian Genocide, the Turks moved on to killing Kurds in the 20s and moved on to killing Shias in the 30s. Uh, so we have to understand that uh, we have a lot of common with that world, and we need to engage there. Uh, and it, it, it's, it astounds me that there's probably not a single uh, Armenian political figure that has a relationship with, for example, Ali Sistani, which is the leader of the Shia world, as far as the highest ranking cleric in Najaf. Why don't we have people that know him? Uh, because at the end of the day, no matter what the West thinks, they're not going to be upset about you having relationships with individuals. Why don't we have those relationships? If you want to give Aliyev uh, sleepless nights, you have uh, Armenian politicians walking in and out of uh, the offices of Shia clerics in Tabriz. Why aren't we doing that? Uh, we have this silly intoxication with the West or have these negative, prejudicial attitudes toward these people. But I, I will remind people that, uh, and a lot of people don't know this, to this day, the only people that have ever denounced human rights violations against Armenian soldiers, beheadings and all the savagery that we've seen, the only body that has done that was the uh, spokesperson for the, Armenian foreign, for the Iranian foreign ministry. It wasn't the West, it wasn't the human rights organizations in London in their pretty offices, it was the foreign minister of Iran. And the last I checked, the only country shooting down Azeri drones outside of us were the Iranians. While the Azeri drones murdering our kids were all made by Western parts, authorized to be sold to them by Western countries via Israel and Turkey. So let's not, uh, let's get to the brass tacks of who did what. So these people who sat there and watched our kids get murdered don't have a right to tell us who to have a relationship with especially when they're telling us, they're, the people they're telling us not to have a relationship with, not only didn't hurt us, probably helped us in many ways, even though some of that stuff we'll never know behind the scenes. So I think we need to uh, invest a lot more into this world, both politically and if you look at even trade. You know, our trade with the EU is 10 times what it is, what it is with Iran. There's no reason for that. Uh, even though it's a closed economy, it's got a thousand problems. Granted, uh, but we need to, there, there's nothing saying we should not upgrade our relationship with Iran, especially given the fact that the people who've told us not to do this are the people who are exactly the people who did nothing for us. And briefly, can you give your thoughts about China and India? And finally, I want to ask, how can we use our culture to help us navigate this world? China and India are the future. You're either there now or you're not there. Uh, you know, uh, historically, going back millennia, China and India have been the great powers of the world. Mm -hmm. It's this, this Western rule of the world is actually an anomaly. It's, 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 it's a three, four hundred year anomaly. Uh, up until a couple of hundred years ago, China and India were always the great powers of the world and rivals of each other. Uh, you know, our kids should be learning Mandarin and Indian and, and Arabic and Persian, uh, far more so than German and French because that's what the market of the world is. If I'm an Armenian winemaker, I don't want to sell to Trader Joe's in the United States or to Tesco in England. I want to, I want to, I want to be on Alibaba selling to the Chinese because you have an audience of a billion people. We need to look east when it comes to work, business and development. Uh, a lot of people don't notice, but the Chinese, I think, are building a billion dollar engineering city in Yerevan right now. So I think we need to look in that direction uh, and uh, that is frankly more business and development than uh, politics because they're too far from us to really have vital interests here. Mm. But when China becomes a world power, they'll have interests everywhere. And especially if our pivot goes north, south rather than east, west, it's going to be Chinese goods going through Armenia, uh, north, south. So I think we need to develop those relationships there. Uh, culture, it's it's fantastically important. 
and, and, I'll, and I'll tell you, you know, we can, we have been successful as a people, survived to a great extent because we have cultural flexibility. You know, you can, you can drop us in, in Sweden, you can drop us in China, and you can drop us in India, and we'll find our way because our, our culture is adept enough to figure the nuances of each of these other cultures, especially since we're a small culture, you always have to fill out. You have to figure out the nuances of stronger, bigger, and more relevant or more important cultures. Uh, and uh, we, you know, one of the reasons that historically, you know, Armenians set up these trade routes from, you know, all the way from Iran to Indonesia is because we understood culture. Uh, and truth be told, given the fact that the, uh, the future is in the East, uh, our cultural affinities with people in India and China or, or the Gulf countries is, is, is far more, uh, we have a lot more common with them than we do with the, with the Danes and the Finns. Nothing against the Danes and the Finns, but when you, when you come down to the brass tacks, the way our cultures work, mm. uh, in fact, I would, I would go as far as say that the, your average Armenian family in, in Armenia has more in common with uh, religious Muslims in certain places than, than we do with the West. I mean, it doesn't mean that you know, we don't want things from the West, but we just have to understand where, where, where the cultures lie. And I think uh, culture translates into everything else. It translates into uh, power, it translates into business, and we always misunderstand or underestimate the importance of it. But I think you touched on it, and, and, it, and, and it, it, the culture is what will open doors for us all over the world. Uh, and it's this cultural flexibility, which I think we need to uh, double down on. Mm. Well, Eric, thank you as always. Thank you. And thank you for joining us on CivilNet.